Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. And our guest for this portion of today's show is Bob Weisberg. Bob's a colleague of ours, uh, the co-director of the Criminal Justice Center at Stanford Law School, and our first two-time Stanford Legal guest. I'm honored. We're honored. Don't we're we. honored to we're honored to have you. I guess I'd like to start by just asking you, you know, you deal with these issues in the context of criminal justice, uh lying, questions about pain, suffering and the like. Um it, as a practical matter, how do you think that the insights that Hank's been telling us about are going to get introduced into the criminal justice system? Well, people are trying to introduce them but having great difficulty and uh there are a couple of reasons broadly stated. First of all, all the questions which Hank has, uh, you know, uh, addressed about just how reliable even the neurological conclusions are. But the greater challenge in some ways or the additional challenge is even if this information uh, was accurate for what it purports to tell us, what is exactly it, what exactly is its relevance to specific issues in criminal law? Uh, and, uh, of course, any time one talks about neuroscience and criminal law, somebody will say, wait, this suggests that we're going to have to uh, acquiesce to a deterministic view of human action. Oh, my gosh, what will happen to free will uh, on which the, uh, the very premise of our criminal justice system? Well, there's that, but one could be more particular about it. Let's just take the issue of lying, for example. Uh, let's assume that uh, the uh, fMRI or other technology could be a perfect lie detector. But when Hank talked about the artificial population of uh, the college students in an artificial setting, uh, it's a very important point uh, in part because uh, it, it is a particular demographic, but also because the experiment assumes uh, something is right or wrong, true or false. I mean, it's artificially set up that way. Questions of truthfulness especially involving a criminal defendant, but also witnesses in a criminal case, are much more nuanced and complicated. Uh, they're often about things like, what did you actually see? What did you understand was going on? What level of risk did you assess? So I think even if we got very far in detecting lying in a binary sense, something is true or false, and you know it's true or false, I think it's going to be complicated there. I mean, can I, can I ask you a question there, which is, that often comes up in the context of particular kind of prosecution for making false statements, Correct. right? So there's a federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 1001, that says right. basically making a false statement to a federal official in the course of his duty is a crime. And that's turned out to be a really devilish area of law to figure out what counts as a false statement. Right. Uh, and there again, context makes a difference uh, because the false statement is often about something that's complicated or abstract. Uh, did you realize that he was, uh, you know, sending your tax money to the wrong shelter and so on and so on? Uh, did you uh, recognize that, uh, you know, there was a danger there that you hadn't? Did you tell the truth earlier? Uh, ironically enough, a question about earlier truth telling. Uh, so it is true that uh, the so-called 1001 violations, uh, the, the uh, false statements uh, charges seem like the sh sharpest uh, uh, context for this question. Even there, I think it would be quite tricky. Uh, in addition to other questions uh, that complicate 1001 violations, like is it really material to a, you know, uh, a federal question? But you could imagine, Bob, in some cases, it would be really useful. I'm innocent of something, and mm -hmm. I can't convince people. Mm -hmm. And I say, start throwing these questions at me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be convicted unless I, I grab this straw, I'm pretty clear that I'm going to be acquitted, at least by the lie detector fMRI. Yeah. I take it that none of these are actually admissible in court right now. Could I bring that up earlier to the cops and say, let me talk to you about this technology? Well, my simple answer to your question is it is as it is done with lie detectors. Uh, criminal suspects or criminal defendants often uh, volunteer to take a lie detector test, uh, and you know, let's assume most of the time they're making a good gamble. Uh, the the, um, the honesty uh, inference cannot be admitted in court, but it sure in heck can affect whether the police will pursue the case or whether the prosecutors will. This so the same same thing for this. 
This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about science and evidence and neurology and neuroscience uh, with our colleagues from the law school, Hank Greeley and Bob Weisberg. Joe? How often I want to come back to people saying, give me a lie detector before you charge me, mm -hmm. for example. How common is that? Not very, uh, because uh, I sense that uh, many lawyers worry, first of all, that their clients are actually going to be found to lie, uh, or uh, will be falsely uh, 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 inferred to be lying uh, because of the inaccuracy of it. It's not very, very common. Uh, very often, the volunteering to do it, uh, even if it's a little disingenuous, is a marker, uh, a, a, you know, a, a sign for the defendant uh, of confidence and something to uh, try to tamp down the prosecution's enthusiasm. I mean, one of the other things that you're really an expert on, Bob, is the Fourth Amendment and the right to kind of keep things private. Do you see a threat coming from this kind of science to Fourth Amendment values? Well, it's interesting that with the talk about fMRIs generally, I mean, we think of, you know, uh, medical patients who obviously fully consent in every sense of the term. Where it is being introduced in court, uh, and there have been a few cases, I believe all civil cases, where uh, the deception, uh, you know, concept has actually entered the court. Uh, and obviously, no general legal resolution of admissibility, but some instances of it. Uh, the the uh, the report, I mean, the, uh, and sometimes uh, I assume the actual picture of the MRI uh, is presented to the jury. Although Hank can speak to that, but also the interpretation of it by an expert. It's proffered by the person whose mind is being uh, examined. Uh, and then it's just a question of admissibility and relevance. But flip it around. Actually, it's a completely unknown question as to whether you could be forced to undergo an fMRI. Uh, it, uh, there are certain things you can be forced to do, like put your finger, fingers on an ink pad. And you have to give a blood sample. You have to give a blood sample with some complications I mean, they, they, they about what you need a warrant. But, you can get but, a warrant. Or DNA samples. Now, let me go to the other end. Yeah. There's a, a not much remembered but important case called Winston versus Lee where a suspect uh, was thought to have a bullet, uh, a bullet fragment well into his arm, the presence of which would absolutely determine whether he was guilty or innocent. The... Uh, the police got a warrant. There was plenty of time to do it. They got a warrant, and the uh, the surgery wouldn't have been life threatening. But the Supreme Court said you, there are certain places literally you can't go. Uh, so whether you would uh, analogize an fMRI to an invasive procedure or to a kind of superficial, you know, external procedure, I think is simply unknown. And if we take Hank's statement that maybe use just the the brain waves then it's not it's not invasive at all that would be you'd have a stronger case we're going to show you something and and check for these waves and hope you don't have the countermeasure of wiggling your toes now the interesting thing there is that it's kind of metaphorical to say that it's not invasive uh, because there are lots of uh, less exotic, uh, though maybe more amusing Fourth Amendment cases, whereby an electronic device or some other device, one of the devices in this case could be a dog with a nose, who is, who or which is external to the house or the person or the bag, but can detect things from the outside that no human senses can detect. And sometimes the degree of invasiveness, just in terms of what it could reveal about someone in terms of privacy, is treated as the equivalent of an actual physical entry. And who knows what would be true of fMRIs then? Yeah, I mean, it's a, re it's a, it's a really, I think it's a really tough question because the DNA evidence that the government now gets from people, they don't need a warrant because it's easy to get the stuff in all kinds of ways that don't invade um, your privacy at all. I mean, I remember when I taught at the FBI Academy, one of the um, instructors telling me about following a guy around for an hour and a half until the guy threw away a coffee sure. cup and then just grabbing the coffee cup. No warrant needed. And, and in fact, uh, the Supreme Court has gone a step farther and said that uh, the police can do a swab to get DNA from anybody who's been arrested for any serious crime with no more specificity. I wonder, we're about to wrap up. Hank, now you've heard Bob's thoughts about how this can be used. Is there anything you would add? Yeah, I think a really hard question that 
will have to confront or maybe our kids will have to confront is cognitive liberty. And do we have a right to protect the insides of our brains, the insides of our skull? Uh, Nita Farahani, a law professor at Duke, has written about the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment and First Amendment. Her conclusion is, unless you got a really, really uh, aggressive court, the current amendments with the current precedents don't cut it. She thinks we need a statute or a constitutional amendment if we want to have any, uh, if we want to try to preserve <coughs> cognitive liberty from the next generation of tools. Let me just add, though, I mean, these tools don't exist. They're not being made for evil dictators. They are being made to try to relieve human suffering. There's a strong moral and political compelling force that's leading to these tools, but they're secondary uses as well. And it's the secondary uses that are what appropriately should be worrying us. I know, and if you've read 1984, you understand exactly what Hank is, Hank is talking about. So thank you so much for joining us today on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121. Great. Thank you. Uh, rats. Stuff. I'm talking about rats. Rats. Give it to Julia. Give it to Julia. <laughs> what do we get paid? <laughs> <laughs>